magic is found in every room where people connect over a shared purpose. In this weekly podcast, Luke, Hannah and Chris explore the role of purpose, courage, mindset and culture in every leader's quest for transformational performance. Hello and welcome to Magic in the Room. I'm Hannah Broderud. And I'm Luke Freeman. And today we're excited for a couple reasons. One, we have the awesome Sarah Elkins back for, I think this is episode number three that we're recording with Sarah. So I think you might have been a part of like every season, maybe. Yeah. Awesome. Wow. <laughs> I, I don't know if there's anyone else who counts for that. Um, Sarah is a storytelling coach um, and uh, also the host founder whatever you want to call it, of uh, kind of a community event. I'm, I'm not sure what to call it. We'll really get into that today called No Longer Virtual. Um, how it embodies itself in real life is a, a gathering of people who are like-minded. Uh, this last February, I went for the first time uh, in Park City, Utah. Amazing experience. And I think that's kind of what we want to talk about today is how do you create an experience, a community kind of from the ether. Um, folks talk about creating movements, talk about creating communities. Um, Sarah, as someone who has done that, I think it will be a great person to help tease that out in the conversation. And I think this is applicable to business leaders, to managers as they build community, to marketers as they build community around products or services, and also just to anyone who's interested in how do I take an idea or something I might be passionate about and turn it into something that actually is embodied in real life. It's a thing and people know about it and they get value from it and they get opportunities to contribute to it. So that's a really long intro, but Sarah, so excited to have you on. Thank you so much. It's an honor. I that's so cool. I, I hadn't even thought about the fact that this was your third season and I get yeah. to participate again. It's it's pretty exciting. Yeah. And and another reason I'm excited is that we're actually recording in person in our home state of Montana. And that's exciting. I think we, when we've had you on before, it's been virtual and now we are no longer virtual today. <laughs> this is the first one that's not a is like zoom recording yeah yeah <laughs> yeah very fun so um all right sarah i'm just gonna ask you how how did this whole nlv no longer virtual thing came about tell us the origin story this makes me smile every time i tell this story because it started so with very little expectation no expectation even when I had been really active on LinkedIn, looking for a job and then finding a job and then using it as a resource, I had connected pretty tightly with a handful of other writers. So when LinkedIn first opened the platform to bloggers, they would have you apply and mm -hmm. send a sample work. And then they may or may not give you access and permissions mm -hmm. to blog. And I was one of the first in the early stages to get that acceptance after the influencers like um, Richard Branson yeah. and Bill Gates had been actively participating. <laughs> and I met these people like uh, Neil Hughes out in the UK and Karthik mm -hmm. Rajan out in Houston. Now, this is all from Montana, which at the time was kind of a big deal for somebody from Montana to be connecting like this nationally and internationally. Yeah. And I met a handful of other people, John White, Heather Younger, mm -hmm. Amy Blaschka. These are all names that may be familiar to you through LinkedIn or may not. But at the time, they were a couple of them had been voted as LinkedIn top voices in mm -hmm. 2016. And I have this vivid memory of having gone back and forth on comments, which is absolutely the gold on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. It's not posting original content. It's not even necessarily sharing content, but the conversations you have in the in that the comments. Yeah. So I had met Karthik Rajan through his writing and he had been reading mine and we'd been commenting back and forth. And we finally decided to get on a phone call. Let's let's just talk for real. And yeah. I remember I programmed his number into my phone so I would know when it was him calling. And I was sitting at my desk when I was working for the city of Helena, 
and his his name popped up when he called me that afternoon when we had scheduled our call. And I got giddy. I mean, it was like, <laughs> oh, my God, a celebrity's calling me. Right. I, I was literally blushing and grinning like this was some a celebrity. Yeah. And I remember picking up the phone and just grinning so much that for the rest of the weekend, this was a Friday afternoon, the rest of the weekend, I'm like massaging my cheeks because <laughs> they were sore from smiling so hard. Mm-hmm. And he had given me so much encouragement about my writing, not necessarily my writing as it was, but the transformation of my writing from when he started following me mm. to that point. And that was really meaningful to me. He helped me grow. Yeah. And I had already scheduled a call with Chris Spurvey and Heather Younger, who were in that that core group for that Sunday afternoon just to talk and see if there was any collaboration in our potential. Mm -hmm. And I remember um, all all through the weekend raving about Karthik to my husband. Oh, my gosh. And he said this and he said that. And his writing is this. And I was so excited. And I remember waking up Sunday morning totally on fire. I have to get these people together. We have to meet face to face. Because if I'm learning this much simply by interacting online and then talking on the phone the learning could be exponentially improved face to face. And I knew that. And I remember that afternoon when I talked to Chris Burby and Heather Younger, I said, if I did this, if I just made arrangements where we could all be together for a couple of days and learn from each other, would you participate in that? Would you pay to mm-hmm. attend something like that? Mm-hmm. Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> no doubt about it. We will be there. You set it up, we'll be there. Yeah. And I remember this moment of, Okay, how do I make this happen so that maybe people could use it as a tax write off if they're self employed or have their employer pay for it? Mm -hmm. Because they're not going to just meet up without having some professional development, travel across the country or from Canada or from the UK just for some random meetup. It has to be a cohesive agenda that people are going to get into and be excited about. And once we all kind of agreed on that, it came together. I love it. And I was not in that very first gathering because I hadn't met you yet. We met in 2017 Mm -hmm. towards the end of that year is when I moved to Montana. And I may have told the story before of how we met, but, you know, I, I was introduced to you by someone on LinkedIn who lives in Australia Mm -hmm. and she heard and, and we had done a similar thing. I'd reached out to her, commented on some of her things. She was a consultant doing similar things that what I was starting to picture myself maybe doing independently. I hadn't quite taken the plunge yet of leaving my corporate the security blanket of my corporate job, <laughs> but I was about to. So I was reaching out to people who had done that. And um, Anna McAfee was one of those people. And she kept popping up because everybody was hosting these LinkedIn local events. Mm -hmm. And it caught my attention because I thought, well, I'm about to move to a new state. Um, I was about to move to Bozeman, which is where we're recording from today. And I I thought I'm going to be starting a new business in a new state in a new town where I don't have a network I don't know anybody so I need to create a network I need some kind of forum so I thought maybe I could start something like a LinkedIn local so I'd reach out to Anna McAfee on LinkedIn and she said why don't we have a a real you know a, a Skype call and I was like Sure. Yeah. Let's have a real conversation. You know, nobody had ever suggested that to me before. Right. So similar story of meeting through, you know, just interacting online and then having a real conversation. And then she heard I was going to be moving to Montana. And Anna said, I only know one person from Montana. Do you know Sarah Elkins? And I said, no, but it sounds like I should. And I connected with you on LinkedIn. And, you know, a few months later, around Thanksgiving, I moved and I messaged you and said, I'm here. And she said, well, my husband and I are playing a show in Butte tomorrow. You want to come dance? (laughs) (laughs) And that's how we met in person for the first time. And so it's an interesting, a little bit parallel story of um, this whole like a relationship that started online and then it 
became an in-person real life friendship. And, you know, that following spring, I went to my first NLV conference. It was the second event Mm -hmm. that you had hosted in Denver. And I've participated ever since. Yes, it was pretty amazing. (laughs) I mean, meeting you in person that first time at the Silver Dollar Saloon in Butte. It was awesome. Yep. And we were just there again for St. Patty's Day at the Silver Dollar Saloon. (laughs) Seeing Rocketeer. Full circle. Yeah. (laughs) Coming full circle. So I'm curious, Sarah, whenever you had that first connection um, with folks and you get everyone kind of rolled in, where, where was it? Well, the first event was in Atlanta. So it was in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. It was at the Ritz Carlton downtown, and they give us a screaming deal. It was like one forty nine a night, wow. which is absurd. But I have to back this up just a little bit. I've been planning events for most of my life, mm-hmm. so taking this on didn't feel like a big deal necessarily. Um, the financial risk was a big deal, and we didn't quite break even until the fifth year. I mean, it's mm-hmm. been it's been hard building this, and I'm not going to pretend like it was easy or no mm-hmm. risk involved. But because I have this event planning background, I worked as a director of sales at a hotel. I've been facilitating meetings most of my career. So that part was the easy part. It was um, getting people to actually register and show up. <laughs> that was the tricky part. It's the hard part. Yeah. yeah. So that first one, everyone shows up in Atlanta. And I'm curious, like, when did you know, okay, there's some magic here? Oh, I love that question. I can tell you the moment we were meeting up in the bar at the hotel and everyone, before the event even started, started, um, people were texting each other and getting each other via email to say, hey, we're in the bar, come meet us. And this is the first time I met Heather Younger in person. Yeah. And... Everyone was hugging. I mean, we had never, none of us, I had met John White once in person and Zach Messler once in person. And that's it. Everyone else, this is the first time. And it was like a family reunion without any of the obligation or awkwardness. <laughs> it was amazing. So that was the first moment I was, I was thinking, okay, wow, wow. Like I... No one had any expectations. Amy Blaschka was there. She actually wrote an article about, would you travel 2,400 miles to meet a group of strangers? And it was, so that was the first moment. And I just want to break Mm -hmm. in for just a second there for people listening, uh, because this idea of the first time people were meeting, were meeting, um, were meeting. (laughs) That's an interesting word. (laughs) Meta-ing. Meta-ing. Yeah. That there that people were hugging, like it sets a tone, you know, so I don't know who started that and who did it. But for folks who are listening, and I, I just learned this recently because I'm pretty introverted. Maybe it doesn't seem like that on the podcast. I don't know. You know, a little bit awkward sometimes. I I'm not a natural hugger. But as a leader, what I have learned is that if you set the tone that this is a place where we can have safe physical contact, it does something neurologically for people, right? And so even in a workshop that we're hosting, if we're working on building it, developing a team, this idea of sequencing physical touch. So back in my old ropes course days, right? Mm -hmm. So you would, you would sequence things and include physical touch in there where it's like people are passing something back and forth. And then people are having to clasp wrists to be able to move across an obstacle. And then eventually, you know, go back to the old classic trust fall, whatever, right? You have to sequence up to that, but it does something in creating a neurological safe space for people and how I use it now as a leader. And this is what I want people to hear is my circuitous route to get to here. You can set the table for meaningful connection, even in how you meet someone for the first time. So if I have any sort of excuse to kind of like do the side hug or whatever it is, I'll take that. Whereas before I would have always kind of deferred to shaking hands, you know, things, just all of the classical things. So 
I, I want people to hear that and say, if there's meaningful connection or the opportunity, enough of an open door, even with your coworkers, if, if it's Monday and you're coming back into the office, like a pat on the shoulder as you walk by someone at their desk, those things are leadership tools, not in a manipulative way, but in a what is the tone that we want to set here kind of way. So I think it means something that you started off this connection with like people hugging in a bar, yeah. like whoever chose to do that instead of shake hands, meeting these professional acquaintances for the first time, like that sets the tone for the community. Mm -hmm. I saw a beautiful illustration of that this past week. I was in a conference in Hawaii. I had to take one for the team. Yeah. Um, rough life. It was, it was rough. I'm but go next time. <laughs> Um, one of the speakers did this activity where he had, so it's a room full of 300 people, right? And he said, get up out of your seat and, um, you're gonna, you're gonna move around the room and you're gonna meet as many people as you possibly can in the, a lot of time go. And people are just like shaking hands, introducing them, shaking hands, introducing themselves, just moving through people. Right. And he said, stop. Okay. Next there's a mystery person in the room and you have to, now you have to meet people, but with the objective of finding the mystery person, the mystery person has a specific pin on their name tag. So now people are just like seeing through you. They're just like staring at you and keep moving going. On. They're moving on. They're looking for someone who isn't you. <laughs> and it turns out Ouch. there wasn't actually a mystery person, right? right? <laughs> but. <laughs> The, it was an interesting experiment. Mm -hmm. And then the third, and then he had everybody stop. And he said, now, I want you to meet people as if you're seeing a long lost friend for the first time in years. And the transformation in the room, like all of a sudden, everybody is just like, they're like, hi, how are you? With this open body language, <laughs> they're hugging strangers. And of course, we're far enough past, you know, the lockdowns of COVID that people are actually out and about meeting in person and they're excited to do it. And just to see how people, just by the prompt and the stage that was set, how the mm -hmm. energy shifted in the room and how everybody just like suddenly opened up and approached each other in a whole different way. It is amazing how the intent mm -hmm. of meeting people shifts the actual experience of meeting people. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. And um, I, I'm a big believer in doing things with intention. That's like one of my key words in everything that I say mm -hmm. is be intentional about this. If you're going to do something that you uh, that is likely to upset somebody else at least be intentional with it. Know in advance that this is going to happen and, and set the stage if you can. I think it's really important to note that those of us who were hugging in the in the bar, it wasn't all of us. Right. Mm -hmm. There are some people who are not huggers, and I respect that. Yes, mm -hmm. and likewise. I really admire the people who aren't huggers who are obvious about it. They, they just say, not a hugger. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. I think just like, uh, I'm going to back up a little bit. When I was the director of sales at a hotel, I read a book about being a good salesperson. And one of the things this woman said in her book was she always has treats on her desk, whether that's candy or um, pens or whatever. It's usually candy. She said, even people who don't take it and eat it, notice it mm -hmm. and they feel hosted by it. So I think that's an important um, piece of this puzzle is there were a lot of us hugging and loving up on each other, being so excited to see each other in person for the first time. And that set the tone, even if they weren't huggers, yeah. even for the people who were watching, they were feeling it because we have, it's all neuroscience, right? Mm -hmm. They have those mirror neurons. And when they mm -hmm. see other people embracing and loving on each other, that was, um, you think about your your brain is being trained or primed, as Melissa Hughes would say, who yeah. was also at that first event. <laughs> yeah, Your brain is being primed to expect something good when you are watching that kind of behavior. Mm. So even people who aren't huggers are welcome at NLV. Yeah. And maybe by the end, they'll feel confident and comfortable enough in that safe space to hug if they want to. And if not, that's OK, too. Yeah. 
Yeah. So back to, I kind of interrupted you. Mm -hmm. So you knew it was magic then. Yes. And then what confirmed it through that first event that like there was a need for this. Mm -hmm. It's, it's not just a wild hair that you decided, you know, Hey, we're going to try this and eh, it was okay. Yes. There were, there were two episodes. One was at the event. So the, it's a Thursday and Friday. So people can stay wherever we're exploring over the weekend if they want. And I almost always manage to negotiate that special room rate through the weekend so people can stay and explore if they want. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's two, two days, Thursday and Friday. And I never plan dinner on Thursday night because there are a lot of introverts in the room that need that space to decompress. And we leave as much space even throughout the day as possible for people to process and decompress if they want to. So I hadn't made any plans for that Thursday night dinner. There were 23 of us in the room. And as I was giving the housekeeping instructions at the end of Thursday, by the way, we were all laughing with tears because we're laughing so hard after that last session, a guy named Dustin McKisson, who's not as active on LinkedIn anymore, was telling stories that literally had us laughing so hard we were crying. <laughs> So we're finally breaking. It's been a long day. We've been in the room since eight o'clock and now it's like six o'clock mm -hmm. and we're still visiting and I'm making these announcements and I'm like, well, just so you know, um, the one of the employees here at the hotel gave me a recommendation for a Chinese restaurant, literally a block from here. We can walk right down the street and Bob, my husband and I are going to walk down there at about 730. Um, and if I could get a show of hands for anyone that wants to join us. That way I can give the, the restaurant a call and let them know, um, you know that we're going to have a larger group. And I'm anticipating maybe eight of us, mm -hmm. right? Almost every hand in the room went up. <laughs> Almost every hand. They weren't tired of each, of each other yet. As a matter of fact, they were eager for more of mm -hmm. that connection. And this is before COVID. Yeah. So you think about the context here. And we're sitting, we ended up 22 of us going out to dinner together. One person had family friends in town and had already made a, an a, uh, arrangement to go have dinner with them. Otherwise, she would have joined us as well. Mm -hmm. But we have all of us sitting at two long tables. Thank goodness this Chinese restaurant accommodated us. They were <laughs> so nice. I actually wrote them a, a thank you note at the end of it all. But they accommodated us. And I remember just trying to breathe and relax, which it was so hard because the energy was so high in there. And I do sometimes look like an introvert when I need to walk away and process things. Mm -hmm. And I remember kind of leaning back and just listening to the conversations. And I was at the head of one table, so I could kind of hear the conversations at both tables. And the thing that struck me was when I heard people at the other table where I wasn't even visible, I heard them talking about, well, next year we should do. And mm. oh my gosh, did you hear about and that was so cool when this happened. And I remember just taking it in and thinking, oh, my goodness, I'm going to have to do this again. <laughs> <laughs> and I, it was uncomfortable. But the other thought was, how do I make tomorrow just as engaging? Because yeah. this is a lot of pressure to keep this level of love and engagement and, and process. Mm -hmm. So that was the first moment that really struck gold for me. Like, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, this is something that's really important. People really want this and they need it. The other moment was a few months later when um, somebody had released their first book. And because of this network, it ended up being a bestseller, like oh. within 48 hours on Amazon, because this person had a pretty good following on LinkedIn, but it wasn't until she put it out to our network, the no longer virtual network, which was the 23 of us plus all the other people who couldn't come who wanted to come. Mm -hmm. mm. So this wasn't just the people who were in the room. Right. This had continued for months after, yeah. which was the key for me, because in, in all of my materials, all my promotional materials, I talk about avoiding the after conference hangover. Which is, and I had just gone to a conference with my work with the city where I had had a really good couple of days and I got some really good takeaways. And I came back to my office and I was pretty excited to implement some of these and apply what I had learned. And within two weeks, because no one else in that office had experienced what I experienced, my motivation just tanked. Hmm. And I was yeah. still applying some of what I learned, 
but it wasn't, it didn't have the impact that it could have had had I had this longer term relationship with the people that I had connected with there. And I'm good at connecting with people. Yeah, you are. And I still, (laughs) well, I love people. Mm -hmm. And I mean, most people, no. (laughs) But the the irony is that, um, you know, I would connect with these people and keep in touch with a handful of them. And I still actually have a friend from that event that I keep in touch with in Florida. And I've never seen her in person again. And that was, what, six years ago. Yeah. Um, but we still reach out and call each other periodically. So I do have those connections. But what was interesting was how long the longevity of this entire group, this community mm-hmm. was building, as you called it, a movement. Yeah. So when you described it as a movement, I'm curious to know what that means to you. Yeah. Because I know what it means to me. <laughs> right. And so, you know, I, I think of it, you know, to me, NLV is community. And we can talk a little bit about like what makes it a community and why is it community. But I've as I've kind of reflected back on our most recent NLV experience where Luke got to go and, you know, and and we're having some real conversations at the end. Is this going to continue or is it not? Right. And I don't know if you're ready to answer that question yet, but, you know, uh, I I've thought about it as, you know, a movement is something that has momentum and something that's moving forward. It's something that is creating kind of a, a, a groundswell. That's what that those are the words that come to mind when I think of a movement. And and to me, NLV is a movement because it started with it always starts with the courage of one individual. There's this YouTube video out there of this guy. He's at like at some outdoor event and it's one guy who just gets up and dances like crazy right and it's just the one guy that's not a movement right. um but then a couple of others start joining in and they're all doing this like crazy dance right and people are just like looking at them and think they're weird but then more and more and more people start joining in and that's when it becomes a movement um because one guy's moving is not a movement, but when others see that and are drawn to it and decide to join, that's when it becomes a movement. And that's been my experience of NLV, right? Of It's like you were out there posing the idea, let's get together. People are joining and they're like, yeah, this is cool. And others are like, mm, I'm not sure about this thing, right? It's kind of weird. It, it's, it's a little <laughs> weird. Uh, It's a lot of money. I don't know. But then more and more people start joining in and it becomes kind of a thing. And to me, it's Mm -hmm. a thing that I would love to see continue. Right. Because I find community of like minded professionals and a lot of diverse thinking. Right. So like minded to me doesn't mean that we're all thinking the same way, but there's an intentionality about why we meet and the kinds of conversations we have and that we're collectively interested in and how we learn from each other. I love that. That just brought a huge smile to my face because I've watched that video. Yeah. It's it's a viral video. Yeah. And um, I love this idea of me doing a crazy dance because <laughs> that's how it felt. Mm-hmm. And people actually said, that's crazy. What are, what are you thinking? Why would you do that? Yeah. And um I have to say, since you invited me for this episode, I've been thinking about how it happened because I didn't have intention in terms of the longevity of this movement. Yeah, you didn't have an intention of creating a movement, right? right? Your intention was let's get together. That was intentional. Right. Let's learn from each other. Yeah. And um, so one of the things that I think happened was that I saw a community in the works, Mm. a community that was creating itself. Hmm. And I just took it to the next level. Yeah. So it was already in the works. And these people had found each other because we provided different views on what each other were doing. Mm -hmm. So, um, for instance, um, Neil Hughes reached out to me after the first one. He said, I was gutted that I couldn't come in 2017. And I, I want to be a part of 2018. Please tell me you're going to do it again. Yeah. And I said, yes, 
I'm going to do it again. And this is what I'm thinking. And if you're here, I want you to to host a session, to co-host. All of the sessions are interactive, co-hosted so that everyone in the room gets to contribute to whatever we're talking about. Mm-hmm. And um, he said, well, oh, no, that's not what I do. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not putting myself in front of anybody. And I said, well, what do you think of hosting a panel discussion on building your brand across multiple media? And he said, oh, yeah, I could do that. And I said, well, think about it. You have Heather Younger, who just published a book. Mm-hmm. You have Amy Blaschka, who just published a book. Amy Blaschka is also doing incredible work in video. Mm-hmm. And we have you with your podcast. He's been doing the Tech Blog Writer podcast. He has over 2,000 episodes. I know. It's crazy. He's amazing. (laughs) He's an amazing resource. And then we had um, John White, who was blogging his way to fame and fortune. Mm -hmm. And um, I said, you can just be the, the conduit to share what people have experienced so that anyone in the room can contribute and also learn what it takes to start a podcast, write and publish a book. People had published books in multiple ways in that organization, not just through a publisher, but also self-publishing and whatever. And um, he said, you know, it'd be great is if we started a new podcast. And he said, you know, wouldn't that be cool? And I said, yeah, I had at least two people or three people at the conference that said that they wanted to start a podcast. So now this is a huge ask. Neil, I'm asking you, would you help somebody start a podcast from scratch, get it going, and then report to the group what that was like, the pitfalls, the the things that you did well, um, and have the two of you, whoever starts a podcast and you, talk through it as a case study. Mm -hmm. That will help everyone in the room. Yeah. And not just people who hadn't ever done a podcast, but people who were considering it and people who were live doing it because they could take away other things and maybe share it with other people and contribute. He said, that's a great idea. I'm in. And I thought, wow, that's a huge thing because that's like probably at the time, this would have been in late 2017, that would have been probably a five to $10,000 gift. Yeah. And I reached out to the people who had said that they wanted to start a podcast. And every one of them said, I'm just too busy. I can't take on another project. And I remember thinking, you're crazy. Why would you turn this down? You can get this. If you said Somebody you wanted to do it. you do this for free. <laughs> I know, exactly. It's really, and I thought, oh my gosh, that's crazy. So I was talking to a, a LinkedIn connection on the phone about the nerves I was experiencing as I was getting prepared to do a storytelling event where I was sharing a personal story at a big event. And he said, Oh, that sounds amazing. You're going to do so great. I'm like, yeah, I'm kind of nervous about it. And then I told him the story about these people turning me down for this gift. And he said, well, why aren't you doing it? It's like the perfect combination because you're a storyteller, storytelling coach, and you do these other things. Why would you not take that opportunity? Hmm. And of course, what's the first thought in my head? Oh, I'm so busy. I have so much to do. I can't take on one more project. And meanwhile, I'm trying to host this event. So it really, you know, it was kind of a big deal. And I did. I, I reached out to Neil and I said, OK, it's got to be me. And he said, oh, I'm so glad you said that. I was hoping you were going to say that. So it's um, I would like to say that I created the community. I didn't. What I did is I provided a conduit to draw that community together in a more significant way. And we didn't have to meet face-to-face to develop these relationships. We didn't. But meeting face-to-face took this to such an extreme level in terms of building our businesses together. Yeah, And even people who are innovators within organizations continue to come back because they keep getting more ideas, more um depth into what they're already doing and ideas to expand that into other places. Mm-hmm. So, And by the way, Neil Hughes, so I was at that session in 2018 when he facilitated that panel and talked about what it takes to start a podcast. And I had literally just launched my own business. I had incorporated my, you know, LLC on January 1st that year. And this is February, I think, that we were getting together, February, early March. And I had really no idea yet what I was doing. I had an idea and I had, you know, 
but it it's evolved since then. And I ended up connecting with Luke and Purpose and Performance Group, and it's just taken off. But that was in the very, very early days of me having left corporate America, starting out on my own. And so I found this community just incredibly helpful and supportive. And that idea of starting a podcast, I felt like it's something I would love to do. I don't really know if I'm ready yet. I don't know what my topic would be. Do I really want to do this alone? But the seed was planted in in early 2017 when I heard that conversation between you and Neil. And fast forward two years to the end of 2019, I'm in Europe, I'm in Norway for several months, and I'd started um, having some more serious conversations with Luke and Chris, our other co-host, and we were working with a marketing group to help us figure out how to talk about what we do. And one of their recommendations was that we start a podcast. And... Chris was like, oh, that's a really heavy lift. And I don't know about the technology. And Luke is like, yeah, that sounds like a lot. And I was like, no, I know how we can do this. I know a guy. I know a guy. guy. I've got a guy. Yeah, I got a guy. (laughs) So we connected with Neil and Neil Hughes is who helped to launch this podcast, Magic in the Room. And if you've been a listener, um, the voice, if you've ever wondered why there's a British voice reading the credits at the end of every episode... Now you know that voice belongs to Neil Hughes, and he is going to be on the podcast very soon. He's the most famous person on the podcast. We've never (laughs) said that, but we actually have like a super famous podcaster on every single episode. Yeah. He's just reading the credits. Yeah. (laughs) All because of LinkedIn and no longer virtual. Exactly. And that's how we all connected, right? And there's Mm -hmm. so many examples of connections like that and relationships that professional relationships that have turned into friendships and vice versa um, that have come out of this mm-hmm. movement. And yeah, I, I fully believe it's it's a movement. So so I just ahead. want to capture this real quick. So there's a great book on marketing called Zag. Um, and I think it's by Marty. I don't remember his last name, so we can put it in the show notes. But one of the things that he talks about is this idea of seeing a wave just as it's forming. Mm. So you guys know, you know, waves, they're just these little ripples out in the ocean. And then as they get closer and the seabed gets closer to the surface, they turn into these big waves that crest. And um, so when we see trends happening and we're able to identify those faster, right, or early, Mm -hmm. we can then capitalize on those and create the conditions to help them grow, crest, whatever. Um, And so for folks listening, I just want you to to hear in Sarah's story, this idea of like the community was already forming this idea of people who maybe had left their corporate gigs or they had a side hustle that was turning into more of a real thing. Oh, and also there's this LinkedIn platform that's providing a means for people to do that and a specific pathway to do that. Okay, well, probably a community is going to form around that and in that. Okay, it starts to form okay, well, where can it flourish? How can it become more meaningful? There are going to be some folks in that community that are going to want to collaborate, are going to want to learn best practice. What does that look like, right? So, you know, I would say it would almost always be a good use of your time to set aside an hour and just think through in whatever field I'm in, Maybe I'm in hospitality or I'm in manufacturing or I'm in um, some sort of services company. What are the things that are coming and how do I just think about what would it look like to create a space for that wave Mm. to be able to be ready for when it's beginning to crest? Um, You know, we're experiencing this right now and i think no longer virtual as well you know there's this huge this wave that was a ripple five ten years ago around solopreneuring and diff and like startup business you know startup culture really becoming a thing technology is certainly a large part of that um for us at purpose and performance group the need for meaningful work We saw that a long time ago. I mean, think about like Southwest Airlines, purpose-driven organizations. They've been working at it for 35, 40 years. So the wave started as a ripple a long time ago. 
But now, I mean, what's happened the last couple of years? It's like, oh, mm-hmm. well, all of a sudden it hit this tipping point. Mm-hmm. And now it's like everyone and their dog is like, well, why am I like working for the corporate overlords? Surely there's something more <laughs> meaningful that I could do out there. And not everyone's going to make the jump, obviously. Not everyone has the means to make the jump. Not everyone not has, everybody wants to. Not everyone wants to mm-hmm. or has a clear pathway or whatever. But all of a sudden this wave has crested and people and organizations have to respond. Yeah. We don't have a clear purpose. We don't create meaningful work. Uh-oh, that's a problem. Yep. And here we are having done purpose work now for you know 10 years more since mm-hmm. we really started digging into it when we were all together in grad school. Yeah. And um yeah, here here we are ready to capitalize on it and this year has been pretty crazy so far. Yeah. So I I just tell all of that story so listeners can make the connection and be thinking about those trends. Um, and this whole no longer virtual thing, I think, is mm-hmm. a great case study in identifying that and then creating space for, for to ride the wave. Absolutely. And I would really encourage people to think if, if you're a leader, what kind of environment are you creating where people feel like they can ask questions, where they feel like they can contribute? Yeah. Because I think the magic of NLV isn't just getting people together to learn from each other, but um, there there are some basic tenets that that I started in 2017 that have continued throughout. One is that there aren't breakout sessions and only because once you break people into groups, certain people are not gonna attend certain groups. Mm -hmm. So the way I described it to Hannah one time was, um, if there are three breakout sessions and one is on storytelling, one is on scaling your business and one is on sales, Mm -hmm. um, Hannah's not gonna go to the sales one. And I'm not going to go to the storytelling one. So the rest of the people in that room miss out on our expertise in that room. And we may think, well, it's not relevant to me because I'm a storytelling coach or it's not relevant to me because I'm a sales coach. It's what I teach people. Why would I go to that session? I actually tend to go to those sessions because I'm like, (laughs) I want to see what this other person teaches about sales. (laughs) Exactly. And that actually shares that. Most people won't. Yeah. And I wouldn't, I would go to the scaling your business thing because even though I would to like to learn more, new, right? I need to scale my business. I yeah. need to keep building my business. Mm-hmm. So um, on top of that, if I'm at the scaling your business thing and I actually have some experience in it, but I'm a storytelling expert, I'm probably not going to speak up. Necess- well, I would, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but me- most people I would think would just sit and listen and they wouldn't necessarily actively participate. Mm-hmm. And then I miss this opportunity to share my expertise with the people in the room. And I'll I'll tell you that this is all part of why we don't do keynote presentations. Now, I'm a keynote speaker. Mm -hmm. I just gave one of my favorite ones last week at the Governor's Conference on Tourism and Recreation here in Montana. It was awesome. But I have to tell you that when I switched 15 minutes later into a breakout session, that was far more interesting and fun for me. Right. Way more. And that's that's why we don't do that at No Longer Virtual. We don't have somebody speaking at the front of the room by themselves because there are so many people sitting right next to you that have some level of expertise in that topic. Mm-hmm. And you're not leveraging that. Right. And that's why and I, I know that's why you keep the gatherings relatively small, right? So that we can mm-hmm. do everything exactly. within the same room um, because and, and that's part of why there are breakouts in bigger conferences so that because if if there's like several hundred people in the room, it's hard to make meaningful connection Absolutely. with that many people. Right. Mm-hmm. So you break people off, you work on a specific topic, you get to know each other a little better. But what's unique about NLV is that it's, you know, it's capped at what 40 or 50 it used to be 50. I dropped it to 40 because I realized, again, exactly what you said. Yeah. Um, when it's 40, everyone has an opportunity to meet every single person and get to know them. Yeah. In the if course it was of the 50, two days. it just takes it over the edge. Mm-hmm. I, I found I found the breaking point and it's 40. So <laughs> <laughs> after five years, you know, it takes a little while to figure that out. Yeah. So um, 
as we kind of start to wrap up the conversation here, I'd love to learn to hear what are some things that you've learned, maybe not even knowing that you were creating a movement, not with the intention of creating this community that's been, you know, thriving for six years now, right? There's been five gatherings because of COVID. Thank you. There's been five gatherings in six <laughs> years. Um but what are some things you've learned about starting a movement and about building community? I love that question because when you invited me to do this, that was one of the thoughts in my head was, if I were to go back, what are the lessons that I would share with others? Mm -hmm. And the first thing is, if you see a community forming and you want to do something yeah. to make it better or to make it even more impactful, mm -hmm. Don't Do I hesitate. hear Maximizer? Strengths, <laughs> strengths I don't coach. have Maximizer, but yes, oh. that's what it is. <laughs> and it's um, it's really that don't be afraid to try it. Yeah. And it was a financial risk. Um, I was willing to to take that risk. And luckily, I have a partner or husband that was willing to and trusted me and believes in me mm -hmm. and my vision for, for something like this. And I really thought it was going to be a one time thing. Yeah. So that would be another lesson. Your your expectations have to be really managed. Yeah. Thinking in terms of I'm starting a movement is probably not going to work. Right. It has to be baby steps. It has to be this community is already forming around the ideas of wanting to support each other and nurture a, a relationship beyond what you can do in, in the standard or typical professional environment. Mm -hmm. And I would say also to give yourself time to really think about what you want out of it. What's the intention? And I made the mistake of not doing that. Yeah. So it was after the second year and that was in Denver. And I had that was a hard year for me personally. Mm. Um, we went through some traumatic experiences with our family, my son in particular. And it was a hard year. And, and we drove down from Montana, from Helena to Denver and hit major snowstorm. It was the scariest. I've been driving in snow since I was 16. It was the scariest driving I've ever experienced. Wow. So we arrived already stressed. Yeah. And then um, and we had brought our musical equipment to do a, a jam session on Friday in the hotel meeting room. Um, and because we had other musicians joining us that were NLVers, uh, Ranjith Abraham plays the keys, so we brought our keyboard down. Uh, Aaron Scogan plays the guitar, so we brought an extra couple of guitars, and we had this amazing jam session, which I've never seen that happen. At it was fun a conference, so I was there. I was, was pretty fun. excited about it. <laughs> so the over the next couple of weeks, now I'm a slow processor. I make decisions very quickly because I'm an activator and I have command in my top talents. And so I make decisions quickly. It takes me months and sometimes years to process something that happened and be able to share it in a way that's meaningful internally to process it and also to explain it to anybody else. It was months later and I was feeling very dissatisfied mm -hmm. and I couldn't figure out why. Hmm. And Aaron Scogan and I were on the phone and he said, well, what what did you expect? And I, I said, well, I try to limit my expectations for this because it's so new and people who show up are different every year. I mean, we have some that we have a handful that come every year. Yeah. Um, but they're you know, they switch in and out and they're all part of the family afterward, even if they don't attend again, like Susan Rooks and mm -hmm. Linda Spiegel. But I remember this moment. He said, well, what did success look like to you? Hmm. How did you measure it? And my first thought was, well, breaking even would have been a good start. <laughs> <laughs> and we lost money in Denver. Yeah. I mean, because there was attrition for the hotel rooms that were canceled at the last minute. And it was it was a hard year for me. And he said, well, what does success look like that doesn't involve finance? Because you knew going into this that it wasn't going to make a profit. This wasn't going to be something that you could make money on mm -hmm. or even cover your own time. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's true. So think about it, Sarah. What does success look like after an event like that? And I realized that success had to look like the continuing relationships, the camaraderie that comes out of this, the success of everyone who attends in terms of what are they going to get out of it? When they leave, what can they do 
with the information and um, support that they gained from attending. Yeah. And that had to be the the end all in terms of what how I measured success. Right. And when I thought about it like that, I, I don't know, blushed, realized that how powerful that event had been two years in a row, yeah. that so many people came back a second year and we're talking every year we debrief on that Friday afternoon before everyone leaves, talk about what they want out of next year, um, who's going to do what in terms of helping out. And I will, I will never forget, even in Denver at that debriefing, having people say, this has made a difference in my life. I learned these skills. I understand my resources now. I have these people that are going to support me and help me and tell me when I'm full of shit. <laughs> um, and that's that's what happens when you create that kind of environment. Yeah, I love it. So, Luke, as you've been, you know, listening um, to Sarah and been part of this conversation, what are some of your key takeaways that surface for you? Yeah, for me. What you just said kind of sums up what I had been thinking, this idea that it made a real difference in people's lives. And, you know, we're talking on this episode about this specific conference, community, whatever you want to call no longer virtual. <laughs> and, you know, it's not going to be a one to one application for a lot of people that listen. But what I do think people can really take away is this idea that lives are impacted and yeah. that there's meaningful, positive change in people's lives. For this specific group of people, it looks one way. For the group of people that you're responsible for or connected to, it might look different. You know, I think about someone who's responsible for marketing or sales of a product. Like, what does actual community, actual improvement of people's lives look like? What sort of movement is there already a groundswell for? And how do you create those win-wins? And I think... All of us want that, right? All of us want our work to improve the lives of the people around us. Mm -hmm. And so really taking that to a time of reflection, I think is important. Um, and the more meaningfulness and improvement of lives we can get out of the efforts that we're, we're putting into building community and building movements, you know, the better the outcomes are going to be. Mm. Yeah, I love that. All right, Sarah. Um, so you are, as we've heard, a, a storytelling coach. You're also a Gallup certified strengths coach. You are an author. You wrote the book, Your Stories Don't Define You, How You Tell Them Will, which is also the title of your podcast, which is now in what its fourth year or how long yeah. has it been? It, it launched December 28th, 2017. So yeah. I have 226 episodes out as of today. Wow. That's Congrats. amazing. So you're officially yeah. good at this. We've always said that <laughs> once we, because we're, we're, we just uh, launched our hundredth episode and our Whoa, goal has been, our benchmark Huge. has been when we make it to 150, we'll be good at this. I think that's <laughs> what Neil said. I, that's what Neil told us. It takes about like, 150 episodes for you to get good at this. So this, we've been reaching for like 150, 150. We're going to get good at this when we get to 150. And you're way past that. So. Well, I still have moments, though. Like the one that I recorded on Monday. I, I loved it. I enjoyed it. I still walked away going, oh, I could have done that better. Yeah, well, <laughs> so. we're always striving to be the best um, version of us and of the products and services that we provide, right? That's right. That's what makes us stay in the game. So how can people connect with you, Sarah? Well, the simplest way is on LinkedIn. And my tagline is the smile is free. So that's Love I that. changed my name to that back when they first allowed you to change the URL for your profile. Yeah. And I was never able to change it back after that to my name <laughs> because once it, st it got sticky, I guess. Um, and I have to shout out to my friend Angie Fiskum, who gave me that tagline. Um, she used to work at Walmart many years ago. And people would say, how can you be so smiley and, and positive in a place like this? And she'd say, well, there's one thing I can give you and the smile is free. And Love I just that. thought, oh, my gosh, I have to own that. <laughs> so thank you, Angie Fiskum. Um, uh, ElkinsConsulting.com is another great place to find me. And of course, any podcast, wherever you listen to them, your stories don't define you, how you tell them well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Yep. And Hannah, if people want to get a hold of us, how would they do that? 
go to purposeandperformancegroup.com or connect with us on social media. We're on LinkedIn, Facebook, and um, also on YouTube. If you want to watch this podcast live, uh, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. Well, you can't watch it live anymore. <laughs> oh, well, if, if you're you listening can, to it right If you want to watch it, <laughs> you can watch passed. it instead of listen to it. <laughs> your chance passed. It already <laughs> happened. Um, but yeah, those are all the ways to connect with us if you want to learn more about how to create meaningful work um, and resilient organizations. We're here to help you do that. Thanks so much, Sarah. And thank you everyone for listening and just grateful for getting to hang out and have the conversation. Thank you so much for hosting me. Magic in the Room is hosted by Chris Province, Anna Bratteru, and Luke Freeman. And produced by Ben West. Theme music is by Evan Grimm. Title track, Fake Love, available on Apple Music. And this podcast was recorded at Story Catcher Studio with video and audio editing and production support by Brad O'Hara and Alicia Crum. With inspiration, strategy and technical support by yours truly, Neil Hughes. Magic in the Room is a production of Purpose and Performance Group. You can find us at purposeandperformancegroup.com and remember, previous episodes are available at magicintheroom.com. Come